Hello, and welcome to this summer 2017 Capital Markets Update video. I'm Jessica Smith, and I'm a Client Services Manager here at Fisher Investments. I'm joined today by the Investment Policy Committee. Ken Fisher. How are you doing, Jessica? Bill Glasser. Good afternoon, Jessica. Jeff Silk. Hello, Jessica. Aaron Anderson. Hi, Jessica. And new to the Investment Policy Committee as of April 1st, Michael Hansen. It's a pleasure to be with you, Jessica. So investors have been following politics very closely. How may any health care reform acts change what we think about the market? Well, it seems to change from day to day. Um, as we're taping this, health care reform seems to be defunct, at least for the moment. But let's take a step back and talk about legislation in general. And let's go back to the idea of global diversification. I think that always the most important thing to do is to contextualize whatever it is you may be contemplating. And the truth is, whether it's a tax change here in the United States, some sort of new health care reform, they will create winners and losers. And we'll have to suss those things out as they happen. But the truth is, virtually none of those things have the ability to take down a global bull market, a global equity market. The scale isn't there for it. What you're talking about is changing things in a single country for a certain group of people or groups of people. And that's not to say it can't be significant, but we want to make sure we provide that context. Secondly, and people always sort of gasp when I say this, I think it's been a really slow news year. I think it's been a slow news summer. If you take away the soap operas and all the sensationalism, much as Ken said, what you have is much less than people hoped and much less than people feared in the way of happening. We think that continues going forward. To the extent new legislation is passed, one of the things we specialize in is making sure we understand those things, not just the things as they happen, but just as Ken said, where people aren't looking, what are the unintended consequences. But you can't do that until you have a piece of legislation to look at, and so until then we have to wait till we have that. What we said at the beginning of the year, uh, I think is working out in politics this year in America, which is that we're running into a new form that people aren't used to of gridlock. This is the gridlock of the president having a good chunk of his own party against him so that you don't actually get big sweeping change, which mostly markets usually don't care for. And you minimize the potential. So if you think at the beginning of the year, uh, President Trump said, I'm going to do these things. Well, we now know that he actually can do a lot less than he had said he would do and that some people hoped and other people feared because he can't get those things so much through Congress. And that feature, we're used to the function of gridlock where you've got a president of one party and a Congress of the other party. We're not used to the form of gridlock that we have today where the president's got the same party as the majority, but part of his own party rebels against him, and you get that form of gridlock. To us, that's a kind of a new thing to think about, and we as a society aren't used to it, but sure as shooting, we're in a form of gridlock right now. We have been, we will be. We predicted that in our written reviews to clients and in our uh, quarterly video at the beginning of the year. And that isn't going to go away. And that speaks to so many other things about politics. We're not in an easy place for a lot to happen in D.C. And for stock markets, forgetting about sociology and forgetting about the long term and what's good or bad away from markets in the short term for markets, that's bullish. And one of the things that I find interesting about what President Trump's quote unquote agenda would be, whether it was health care change or change in regulations or being less regulated in the financial markets or tax changes, we, the, the whole Trump quote unquote plan. Some people liked it, some people didn't like it. But what I find interesting is when people say we're in the Trump rally. And for all those reasons that I just said, people think that's going to lift stocks and has lifted stocks, and that's why the market has been so strong. But what most people don't fully appreciate is the market really started taking off in February of 2016, long before people thought that Trump even had a chance, long before President Trump became president. And so for all the people who thought this is the Trump rally, they're really missing out on a big fundamental feature. 
and that is that this leg, upward leg in the stock market, really started in February of 2016, tied to improving economic conditions, tied to the foreign economy starting to really kick in, tied to earnings improving, and all that really started in February. And it didn't and tied start- to falling uncertainty. And tied to falling uncertainty. And it didn't start when President Trump became president. Just it, 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 in fact, uh, in my July 24th USA Today column, it was specifically on that topic. And my point would be when that started in February, as I said in, in, in that column, when that started in February, nobody at that point in time would have thought it was a Trump rally. When it was rallying in the spring and Mr. Trump was moving to become the leader in the Republican primaries uh, in March, nobody is thinking, oh boy, this is a, a Trump rally because he's going to become president. After he more or less becomes the presumptive nominee but is not yet the nominee on the Republican side, you don't hear people thinking, boy, oh boy, this is great. We're going to get Trump as president and this is the Trump rally. Then he gets the nomination and most people presumed he wouldn't get elected. And the overwhelming betting odds were that uh, Ms. Clinton would prevail. And we all remember all of that. And nobody's saying, boy, oh boy, this is a Trump rally. And then he wins and people are surprised and the market goes up and people start saying it's a Trump rally. And, and the reality, as we said at the time, and as I said in my former Forbes column and in my Financial Times column in those days before Forbes ended its financial columnists and I started with USA Today, what we said then was that we would get a winner. It would be either Mr. Trump or Ms. Clinton. We were pretty sure that somebody was going to win and with the winning would come falling uncertainty and this was just all part of the falling uncertainty game and that it isn't about Mr. Trump, or it wouldn't have been about Ms. Clinton, and it isn't about the president, and the president's less important than people want to think. We, we, we too much treat the president always like the president's a king, with, a, with kingly power or despotic power, and we really don't want a, somebody with despotic power. We really want the system that we have, which many people don't seem to understand because we still have so many people that are upset that Mr. Trump is the president when he lost a popular vote. But the system is what the system is, and that system leads in this circumstance to falling uncertainty, and it's the falling uncertainty that fuels the bull market, which is what we have to deal with, what we have to be about, because we're not really in the sociology business, we're not in the politics for the sake of politics business. Our visions of politics have to be about how they impact stocks and bonds. The news media has been the center of a lot of controversy this year. What are your thoughts on how that impacts investor sentiment? Well, one thing that's quantifiable that's transpired here recently is people are increasingly losing faith in the media. I and mean, we've said for a long time, and we're not the only ones who've said it, but we certainly have emphasized the fact that this seemed to us to have been one of the least loved bull markets of all time. And I think a reason for that is because there's been this constant drone for the media that everything's bad in one way or another. And coming out of the financial crisis, it's, isn't there another one right around the corner? And every issue gets blown out of proportion and has people overly cautious. And I think one of the reasons that this has been such an unloved market is because you've had this constant weight of negative sentiment coming from the media for a long time. And really that comes down to the economics of media. So much of it being online these days that you need to be sensationalized, you need to fight for eyeballs, nobody's going to click on your story if you're saying everything's hunky-dory, but when you say, hey, there's a potential disaster around the corner and you need to read my article to figure out what that might be, you're going to get more clicks and more eyeballs, and that's what people are shooting for these days. So that constant drone of negativity, I think, has really been a weight on investor sentiment. What you're seeing here quantifiably, and you can see this in polling that's done, is that people are losing, losing faith in the media. And sometimes people see that and they say, oh boy, well, if you can't believe the media anymore, who can you believe? This has to be a negative thing. We would say that's a positive, because the less people believe that boy cries wolf story and the more they rely on their personal experiences, what's going on in their lives and in their communities and with their families and so forth, which we would argue is by and large pretty good, but when you're constantly reading that somewhere in some far off place things are terrible, you just don't have that much faith in the world. So the less people believe in that drone of negativity and the more they rely on what they're seeing around themselves every day, the more likely they are to progress up that 
uh, path of becoming more optimistic and having more confidence and maybe set aside some of the negativity that's continuously coming from the media, that should be one key force that allows sentiment to progress from here. Just less believe in the weight of negative media sentiment, more confidence in what you see around you. And what you see around you, I think most people would acknowledge is by and large pretty good. Not perfect, but a lot better than what you read in the media every day. The fact that Mr. Trump won when pretty much nobody expected he could or would is just one more nail in the coffin of falling credibility. And then since then, the relatively apparent war between Mr. Trump and the media, some can say, and I don't want to dispute it, hurts Mr. Trump, but it also hurts the media. And there are singular pieces of the media that have actually won from that. And I don't want to dispute that either, because some people will point to those. But overall for media, it's been a negative. Overall for media, it's this whole war with the president actually does not help media overall. It actually hurts media overall. And it's our opinion, but we can't quite document it, and yet I hope to be able to document it uh, within a couple of months, that this whole phenomena uh, actually is measurably self-damaging when they don't see themselves that they're doing themselves harm, that effectively what we're getting is fatigue at these stories. That what people really do is turn away when they've seen so much of all this stuff. It's just like they suck the oxygen out of a room and nobody can breathe anymore. They gotta get out of the room. And that's bullish. I didn't say this before, I've mentioned my USA Today column a couple times, and uh, it's one more place that our clients can turn to to hear our views in a macro sense of the markets and more regularly now than ever before. Um, and I encourage clients to take a look there online if they can on Mondays because I speak to so many things that you otherwise would be getting one out of four if I was writing in Forbes still or one out of four in, let's say, my Financial Times column. Um, but here's every week. so. I encourage people to use that frequency. The news media is often very concerned with markets at all-time highs. Should investors be worried about all-time highs? And could it lead to a bear market? The answer is almost unequivocally no. Um, a bull market, by definition, is one that has a lot of new all-time highs. And as a matter of fact, some of the more notable bull markets through history have hundreds of new all-time highs. Um, very coincident with all we've been talking about tied to sentiment and how to understand optimism and euphoria. When people are talking a lot about being worried about all-time highs, in a certain sense that tells us that there's probably a lot more all-time highs to come. Bull markets are made of those. You should have a lot of them. They persist for longer than people think, and we think they can just keep coming. Said another way, in a sentiment-driven euphoric peak, nobody's worrying about all-time highs. When you actually get to a sentiment-driven euphoric peak, to the extent that people have had that fear before, that fear gets forgotten about. Nobody's talking about now what people are talking about is they can see the future. They can see into the distance. They know that it's going to keep going. And you see that in mass, and they stop worrying about this other stuff. Now, of course, ultimately, there is one all-time high that matters. The last one in a cycle is going to be the last high point before you get into a bear market. But it's not the all-time high that causes the market to to roll over. There is one technically, of course, but there's nothing about hitting new highs that suggests a downturn is around the corner. As Mike mentioned, you get many, many, many new all-time highs over the course of a bull market. In fact, if you just go through back and look at all the all-time highs the market hits, it's up way more often than it's down afterward because it's just that one peak of a market cycle before it rolls over. But when it rolls over, it's not rolling over because it hit an all-time high. It's you get the wall, you get the wall up, you get something that causes a bear market to begin. Technically, it does hit an all-time high leading into that, but it's not the all-time highness that causes it to roll over. The Fed has continued to raise short-term interest rates this year and has announced plans to reduce its balance sheet. What are our thoughts on the Fed normalizing monetary policy? Well, I guess it depends on how you think of normalization. If you think of normalization as the gradual increase in short-term interest rates, well, the impact of that has been a flattening of the yield curve. And as the yield curve is flattened, that's disincentivized banks to lend. That in, that in turn has put a lid on inflation expectations and, and really anchored long-term interest rates. And fundamentally, 
that's a headwind to many U.S. banks. Now, if you think about the normalization in terms of the Fed's balance sheet and reducing the size of the balance sheet, remember the, the Fed engaged in three rounds of quantitative easing, which greatly increased the size of its balance sheet, which has led to a lot of concern of how they unwind that in, in the process of which by they unwind that. And what they've said, and they've gone at great lengths to be very transparent and be very deliberate in the sense that they're going to allow the assets that they've acquired to mature and organically and naturally roll off its balance sheet while capping how much can, can mature on any given, well, not mature, but how much they'll allow to roll off their balance sheet on any given month. So it's going to be very, very gradual in nature. They're trying to be very transparent in nature. And we could debate the impacts of that. I think Quite frankly, we don't know because we've really never been in this type of situation before. So it's something we're watching very, very closely. But at this point, there's nothing that terribly concerns us with what the Fed is, is about to engage in. What we said for years, going back to the beginning of so-called quantitative easing in America, was that it was not quantitative easing. It was quantitative diseasing and that the quantitative diseasing was actually bad. And so many people thought because I don't think they understood how monetary policy really works, that we had an expansion and a bull market because of quantitative easing, which was in fact a flattening of the yield curve at the time, such that they believed that this was stimulative. And what we said from the beginning was, no, it is not stimulative. It is never stimulative. It is not inflationary. They thought we were printing money. We said, no, the quantity of money is not actually increasing. Go measure it. It's increasing at the slowest rate of any economic expansion in modern history on an inflation-adjusted basis, any way you measure it. And that quantitative easing, as it is called, is always contractionary and deflationary, and that we're having a bull market and an economic expansion despite it, not because of it. Once you grasp that notion, the notion of the ending of it was bullish, and the notion of the unwinding of it should be bullish. I mean, all this, in my mind, falls right into the theme we've highlighted a lot today of falling uncertainty being good for markets. When people are worried about valuations or markets hitting all-time high or what the Fed is doing or isn't doing or European elections or whatever it is, and ultimately the results are less benign or more benign than they fear, uncertainty falls. And so you take something like the Fed and you've had these big bouts of concern and consternation with the taper tantrum and the first hike and the second hike and the third hike and the fourth hike. And now as we move farther along that process, people worry about those things less as they see they don't have these big disastrous implications. And everyone's worried about love or hating, loving or hating Trump and the administration. And when they realize that there's actually gridlock going on, uncertainty falls and people don't worry about those things. We're in the midst of a massive period of falling uncertainty in a lot of ways, whether it's disbelieving what the media has been telling us, disbelieving the misconceived notion that the Fed has been responsible for this bull market and for the economic expansion, or in what could be a protracted period of people just gaining more confidence in the world, worrying a lot less about these things. It's that falling uncertainty that's driving the market. And all these things kind of fall into that category of a lot of concern about them previously, less concern about them today, probably more of that to come. That's going to be a key driver of stocks no. going forward. Ken, Bill, Jeff, Aaron, and Michael, thank you for spending time with us and sharing your insights. And to everyone watching, on behalf of Fisher Investments, thank you for joining us. Thank you for viewing the Capital Markets Update. For views on current events in the world of investing, visit marketminder.com. Updated daily, it offers on-demand access to Fisher Investments' most current thoughts on capital markets and the global economy, as well as our sometimes irreverent commentary. We hope you will enjoy it.